Yes, sir. Your Excellency, Mr. President, dear participants of conference, on behalf of all attendees, I am honored to thank President Ilham Aliyev for his participation today at our conference and for willingness to share his vision for the future of the region. President Aliyev is the founder of our university and has always been a strong supporter of educational reform in the country. His vision for modern university in Azerbaijan and turning it into an international platform for academic and policy discussions is serving our today's event very well as ADA University is one of the main organizers of this conference. Mr. President, welcoming you at our university, I would like to take this opportunity and on behalf of faculty and students, congratulate you with decisive victory in Karabakh war, which has resulted in the liberation of internationally recognized lands of Azerbaijan and restoration of territorial integrity of our country. We have longed and dreamed of these days for 30 years, and your leadership, as well as heroic sacrifice of our fallen heroes, have given Azerbaijani nation this wonderful moment of joy and glory. Dear participants, we are holding this discussion following your trip to Agdam, one of the liberated regions of Karabakh, where you have witnessed destruction and the horrible impact of Armenian occupation. The war is over, and now is the time for the new vision for South Caucasus, with a focus on development and cooperation in order to make Karabakh one of the best regions of the world. Faculty of our university have been involved in various policy formulation meetings, as well as conduct of repatriation survey among the IDPs to help our government in reconstruction efforts. Your contribution, ideas, and input in this regard come very helpful to us, and we thank you for traveling to Baku and joining our conference. Mr. President, once again, we thank you for your time, and it is my great honor to pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express gratitude to Ada University and to Rector Mr. Pashai for organizing such an event. I'm glad that Ada University, uh, within a relatively short period of time, became one of the leading universities in Azerbaijan and has a very broad international connections. Uh, also, I'm very grateful to the participants of the conference for their participation, because as you uh, can imagine, the situation um, after war is um, very fragile, though the ceasefire is being uh, maintained, but still there are a lot of questions about post-conflict development, and uh, the topic of the conference is post-conflict development and cooperation. Therefore, once again, thank you to all the participants for your attendance. We consider this as not only a sign of interest to what is happening here uh, in the region, but also as a sign of your solidarity with the people of Azerbaijan who suffered from Armenian occupation for 30 years. Uh, before talking about post-conflict development, uh, we need to understand that uh, our lands were under occupation for 30 years. And we cannot exclude uh, our memory, the memory of those who lost uh, family members, the memory of those who were deprived from the fundamental right to live on their own land. We cannot uh, forget uh, the atrocities we cannot uh, committed by Armenian army. We cannot uh, and will never forget Hojali genocide. 
and the victims of innocent victims of Hoja the genocide uh, organized by the leaders of uh, Armenia and so-called uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, regime. Uh, therefore, it's very important to understand that this memory will be with us. Uh, we will keep it in our heart. Uh, at the same time, we need to look uh, to the future. Uh, also, the destructions on the territories which we liberated are beyond all our worst expectations, because we more or less knew what uh, Armenians have done to our citizen villages, because there have been from time to time some video footages, some information from some inf international um, representatives who managed to visit those lands. Um, by the way, probably you know that um, foreigners who were illegally visiting uh, then Nagorno-Karabakh were deprived from visiting the territories which you have visited. They were deprived from going to Agdam, to Fizuli, to other territories which surrounded the former Nagorno-Karabakh administrative district because uh, Armenian government didn't want foreigners to see uh, the devastation and uh, to see uh, their hatred to Azerbaijanis because it's clear that um, those destructions and devastations were done after the First Karabakh War stopped because it's not possible to destroy cities and villages during the war. They did it deliberately uh, in order to erase the legacy of Azerbaijani culture, in order to erase these territories from our memories in order to change the uh, origin of those lands. Uh, therefore, we uh, need to understand uh, the feelings of Azerbaijani people. And now when uh, we uh, return to those lands and when we see with our own eyes what uh, <coughs> the occupational Armenian forces did, to our historical monuments, religious monuments, to our cities and villages. Of course, this is an important factor in order to understand the, our steps with respect to post-conflict situation. You are all very well aware about what happened. You were involved in this um, uh, process. You know, so there is no need for me to make kind of a long speech talking about um, 30 years of uh, occupation. Uh, probably I will conclude now in order to have more time for discussions. So thank you once again for being with us. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, with your permission, we can start our question and answer section as we have more than 10 speakers who have subscribed for asking questions and expressing their comments. Our first uh, question and comment starts with Matthew Breiser, former co-chair of the MIS Group. Thank you, Mr. Hajiyev. Thank you, Mr. President, for the honor to be with you. Very, very nice to see you in this new world. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on where you just left off about the mindsets, both in Armenia and in Azerbaijan, and the fact that this, this decisive victory that Azerbaijan won through a combination of, of innovative technologies and tactics, uh, but also uh, incredible bravery, um, that that, um, ref I don't think people understand that you conducted the war in a restrained way. The uh, collateral damage or civilian casualties were at a minimum. Um, you showed strategic vision by pausing after you won the military phase of the war in Shusha. Consistently, the war aims that were articulated were, con were also consistent with years of negotiations and preliminary agreement back in 2009 on the so-called basic principles. I mean, the November 9-10 agreement is essentially the basic principles, except there's no possibility in the change of Nagorno-Karabakh's legal status because Armenia didn't accept throughout the war the, the, that solution and then lost the war. So my question is, um, is there any sense in Armenia, do you feel it at all, that there is an appreciation that the way the war was conducted was actually quite restrained and then should create an opening for some sort of overtime uh, 
Oh, reconciliation. Oh, and the second question is, I'm supposed to ask if you might be willing to take a group photo with us later. <laughs> yes, sure, sure, <laughs> of course. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. You are a person who was directly involved in the negotiation process. Therefore, you know uh, what was our position, you know what was Armenian position, and all those Azerbaijani position was constructive. Because, as I said many times during our meetings with your uh, former colleagues, ambassadors of the Minsk Group, from France and Russia that Azerbaijan always was interested in finding soon a solution to the conflict because we were the suffering side. And I had a strong feeling during negotiations and I shared it with you that uh, Armenia doesn't want solution. They say they want, but they do everything in order not to have this solution. And what we've seen after we liberated the territories, those fortifications, those huge uh, maybe hundred millions of dollars investments in mining, in the building these uh, defense lines. We clearly understand that they were doing it in order to keep these lands under occupation forever. So their tactics was actually to be in the process of negotiations, I mean the previous governments, uh, to have kind of a process to imitate, to negotiate, to agree on something, disagree on other things, but when it comes to uh, making a decisive step, to step back as it was in France, in Rambouillet, as it was uh, in 2009, after um, uh, Armenia side actually rejected the formula of settlement, which provided the liberation of the uh, surrounding territories of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan, and uh, leaving the so-called status for uh, future negotiations. Therefore, um, this is how it, uh, it worked, so you know it very well. With respect to our behavior during the war, from the very beginning, it was uh, very clear that Azerbaijan is conducting uh, not only the war of 21st century, but the war of new uh, morality, if I may say so. Uh, when war started, my immediate uh, commands to our military servicemen was to uh, behave with dignity, to behave in a uh, moderate way, and to do maximum in order not to damage civilians. And the fact that there have been less than 40 uh, victims uh, on Armenian side among civilians clearly demonstrated, because we were liberating territories, and uh, these some territories were illegally inhabited. Therefore, uh, our um, attacks, uh, our technical capability was aimed only on military objects. And those less than 40 victims uh, which Armenian side had, most of them, were put, those people were participating in the military operations. They were civilians who were recruited to the uh, you know, military units and they were part of military operations. Uh, the way how we treated those who were left behind also is a clear demonstration of the human nature of our policy and the human behavior of our army. There have been several uh, elderly people left behind, for instance, in the province of uh, Hadrut. And when our soldiers came, they, they saw these people, they were frightened. The elderly people, they spoke very good Azerbaijani because, uh, you know, they lived together with Azerbaijanis and they were uh, taken to the hospital. They were treated in our hospitals. Then when we decided and the Red Cross was involved to return them back, Armenians refused to receive them. One of the, uh, you know, elderly who was in poor health conditions, they refused to receive him because they said that we don't want to take care of him. So we, together with Red Cross, put him to the hospital in Azerbaijan. So, uh, and uh, with respect to uh, the question, do they in Armenia appreciate uh, our behavior? I would say no. And this is a very unfortunate development of events because if we're talking now about post-conflict situation, we need to uh, concentrate on some elements which can lead to future reconciliation. 
but there have been such a long period of deliberate policy of demonization of Azerbaijan, inventing stories, presenting Azerbaijanis as enemies, as those who, uh, you know, occupied Armenia or occupied Karabakh. So uh, probably it takes time for the society to understand. And um, not only during the war, but um, even after war, what we have done. We returned more than 1,500 dead bodies of Armenian soldiers. We are still participating together with uh, Russian peacekeepers in these uh, searching operations. And I can tell you that in the first Karabakh war, we had almost 4,000 missing Azerbaijani soldiers. None of them was returned. None of them. So this is the difference. We um, <coughs> provide uh, easy transportation and uh, logistical support to Russian peacekeeping uh, forces through our railroad. They bring their goods to, by the railroad to Bardar. It's much easier and cheaper rather than to fly to Yerevan and then go five hours or six hours by Lachin corridor. And uh, many other uh, elements I can bring. Uh, we allowed uh, Russian uh, Gazprom to transport uh, natural gas to Armenia through Azerbaijani territory because of the repair work on Russian territory. We could have said no, but we said yes, this is another sign, another gesture. We allow Armenians to use 21 kilometers of our road uh, in Zangilan and Kubadli district, which is a road situated on Azerbaijani territory, but was used by Armenians, and we allow, we do not block it. Did they allow us to move one meter to the territories which were <laughs> occupied during the war? No. So these are all unilateral steps, and it's not only a gesture, it's a deliberate policy of turning the page of the war. And I said, despite of what I said in the introductory comments that we will never forget. At the same time, we need to look to the future. And I think here we uh, expect more activity from uh, human society, of, uh, of uh, <coughs> civil society, I'm sorry, of Armenia. Because neither government nor opposition today will not even uh, afford them to say any even not a positive, a neutral word about Azerbaijan. Because it's a concept of Azerbaijanophobia. It's a decades of cultivation of hatred against Azerbaijanis now actually deprive them from their right. But I think they should find uh, courage and they should start telling truth to Armenian people because uh, the war is already in the history. The conflict is resolved. And we need to look to the future. Thank you. In our list, our uh, second question for Mr. Lawrence Broyers, Reconciliation Resources. And Lawrence Boyers joins us online version. Mr. Boyers, floor is yours. No. Mr. C uh, can you hear me? Yes, now yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, Mr. President, uh, in, in the late 1990s, uh, there was a view in Azerbaijan uh, that civil society and NGOs could come in and work with populations to build confidence uh, once the conflict was solved. Um, and I wanted to pick up on, on where you left off there by asking you, uh, what is your thinking now, given that you have, have said uh, that the conflict is resolved? Uh, what should be the roles of civil society uh, and peace building in this new vision uh, for the region? Thank you. Uh, I think that they can play a crucial role, especially with respect to what I said about my expectations from a political segment of Armenian society. Therefore, it's a big room for civil society to uh, make steps with respect to reconciliation. But I can tell you, probably you know that even those very few representatives of Armenian civil society who speak for peace with Azerbaijan are becoming a subject of uh, attacks. 
and uh, public attacks and sometimes physical attacks. They are announced as, as traitors. Uh, Armenian politicians call them Turks. In their political slang, probably it is a very insultive word. And uh, they're being, uh, you know, uh, frightened by politicians. We made steps of uh, building bridges between our civil society members even during the conflict. There have been uh, two uh, delegations visiting uh, Armenia, Karabakh, and uh, coming to Baku. Uh, but uh, after the second uh, trip of representatives of civil society, journalists, and some members of parliament, Armenian side stopped it. And when I asked then uh, uh, former Armenian president Sarkisian why they stopped it, there was no answer. Then we found out that they were afraid that there could be some uh, rapprochement, there could be some, uh, you know, elements of cooperation. They were always blocking that. But now I don't think that they're in this position. But uh, we need to um, be able to deliver our messages to Armenian society. Our resources are very limited. The public space in Armenia is strongly controlled by the government. And as I said, any positive uh, sign or word about Azerbaijan is uh, considered to be a uh, treason. Therefore, I think that international organizations, especially those who have experience in dealing with these kind of issues of post-conflict uh, reconciliation or normalization, confidence-building measures, I think we count uh, a lot, should count a lot on the support from international NGOs, and Azerbaijan is ready to work with them on this issue. Uh, next one now our list, Mr. Carlo Frappi, University of Venice, Italy. Thanks, Mr. President. It's an honor being here. Uh, my question revolves around the need for reconstruction again and how Azerbaijani partners can, may be helpful in that, and particularly on Italian-Azerbaijani relations. 2020 was a watershed in our relations. Um, it, this is not only because of the uh, inauguration of the Southern Gas Corridor, finally, but I would say it's the result of a wider uh, engagement, especially as a result of the state visit last February. Uh, in Italy, uh, which can be seen as a watershed. Um, declaration, a joint declaration on a multidimensional strategic partnership was signed, whereby, I would highlight this, Italy for the first time made an open commitment to Azerbaijani inter, uh, territorial integrity. So somehow, even with a departure from previous policy of equidistance, and also somehow kind of departure from what our European friends uh, were doing and are still doing. So this kind of commitment was symbolically reiterated also in the aftermath of the war. I remember this uh, very high profile visit to the liberated territories by a high profile Italian delegation. And on that occasion, Mr. President, you said that the, um, you expressed Azerbaijani determination to closely work with Italy on this reconstruction process. So my question is, what is currently the state of the art? Uh, and especially what we may expect in the coming future and how Italy can uh, be helpful, not only in the reconstruction process, but also in this need for reconciliation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I fully agree with what you said about our bilateral partnership. Italy for us is a very close friend and partner. And I still remember uh, my visit, a state visit to Italy last February. As you know, before that, the president of Italy, Mr. Mattarella, paid a state visit to Azerbaijan. And my visit was also uh, kind of continuation of our strategic dialogue. And as you said, we signed a document uh, on strategic partnership. By the way, it's the second. Uh, we already signed one. It was signed uh, uh, several years ago. So this really demonstrates our mutual commitment. 
And uh, also, as you correctly mentioned, we are very grateful to Italy for their straightforward, just uh, approach with respect to the resolution of the conflict, which uh, we know that was not easy to articulate, especially in the European Union family, where there are very strong, uh, powerful Armenian supporters who always uh, tried uh, you know, to put on the same scale the victim of occupation and uh, occupational forces. So that was really a very important sign of cooperation. And also I can tell you that uh, we have already with nine EU member states signed documents on strategic partnership. I think some of them were also encouraged by what we've done with Italy. So our political relations are excellent. We continue strong cooperation, and this cooperation was already tested during the conflict and in post-war period. And as you correctly mentioned, the visit of Italian delegation to the liberated territories is considered by us as another sign of support. I can tell you that uh, from the very first days of our plans for reconstruction, we invited Italian companies. We invited them through Italian embassy. Uh, here, by the way, the ambassador who already terminated his duties was very active in promoting Italian interests and Italian business, and uh, he is a very good friend of Azerbaijan. So we approached the uh, Italian embassy in order to give us some recommendations with respect to Italian companies. We had previous contacts because Italian companies implemented uh, big projects here, petrochemicals, refinery, construction, uh, architectural projects. And they already started. They already started and we want to expand the presence of Italian companies. As I said, uh, after war, we will invite uh, companies from friendly countries. And this is natural, because the period of war was a kind of a clear indicator for us who is who. Of course, we had some assumptions. We more or less could uh, predict what will be the position of this country or that country. But uh, to say 100%, we were not sure. But the war made everything clear. Uh, among the areas where Italian companies already have been invited, I can tell you maybe uh, one of the most important, we invited Italian companies to uh, participate in the uh, project of different uh, museums and war memorials, because we will have uh, museums of victory and war memorials not only in Baku, but in other cities liberated. So this is one area. Another area where we invited uh, Italian companies already is uh, power generation. Uh, already the contacts have started. And after war, already not only contacts, already uh, some preliminary documents have been signed because there's a huge potential of power generation on the liberated territories particularly renewable, water, uh, sun, and wind. And already preliminary documents have been signed. We count very much on uh, using Italian experience in uh, developing agriculture on the liberated territories because it's a very uh, good fertile soil on those areas and we can have maximum productivity. And uh, I can tell you that uh, now, at this moment, among uh, foreign companies, we have uh, only Turkish, Italian, and British companies who already uh, are working with uh, the Azerbaijani counterparts. Of course, we are now only in the first stage of development, uh, though physical uh, reconstructions have already started. Infrastructure projects have already been launched, but there'll be huge uh, potential for the future. And of course, there'll be more other companies from different countries. We want all our friends to be part of reconstruction, all our friends to benefit from these opportunities, because we uh, as a nation and we as, as a government are very grateful 
this is our nature. If someone does us something good, we will always keep it in our heart and we'll try to do everything to reciprocate. So uh, taking all that into account, our friendly relations, strong political ties, great experience of Italian companies, uh, and also our plans to uh, restore our historical and religious sites, and uh, Italy is a world uh, center of culture. That's my opinion, I'm sure you share it with me. Therefore, there'll be huge and diversified uh, opportunities for working together. Uh, Nikyar Gyuksel, International Crisis Group, Turkish branch. Jenna, President. Uh, yesterday we were in Antam and we saw the, the massive physical destruction, but we were also able to imagine the, the tragedy of the lives torn apart and, and um, the sort of uh, the human cost. Um, and I imagine, besides the reconstruction, when the local people of Agdam return to their homes, it's going to take some time and effort for them to build trust to the, with the Armenian villages nearby to be able to interact. So I was wondering what kind of um, steps you expect from the Armenian side, also the Armenians in Karabakh, to build that trust again so that they can live side by side without peacekeepers, inshallah, one day. And also, um, in the bigger picture, I was wondering whether in the, in the short or medium term you think it would be useful for Turkey to open its border with Armenia, both for regional integration and to address the, the demonization and the Turkophobia that we see so rampant in, in the society. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, it is difficult uh, to predict how Azerbaijanis and Armenians will interact in the future. I think to a large degree it uh, will depend on the will and political wisdom of politicians. Because uh, I think we need to be more active here and in, in uh, Yerevan in order to try to build bridges. Of course, if Armenia wants that, we don't know what are the intentions. They never uh, elaborated on that. I already on several occasions made it very clear that we consider the page of the conflict turned down. We even uh, can talk, and I already said it a couple of times, about uh, possible peace agreement with Armenia. And this is our plans. But we do not have any messages of this kind from Armenian side. Armenian prime minister is silent. Armenian foreign minister is very aggressive and uh, Armenia is not in this situation now to afford themselves to be aggressive against Azerbaijan. They should remember that uh, what happened during the war. Uh, Armenian opposition is actually now in hysteria and Azerbaijanophobia, Turkophobia became uh, one of the main, it always was very important, but now it's, I think, the only factor. And I'm sure that they will build their election campaign on Azerbaijanophobia, Turkophobia, on the feelings of revanchism. Therefore, we cannot establish this interaction unilaterally. Our position is clear. We are ready for that. It will not be easy. Those uh, refugees who will, uh, former refugees who will return to Agdam and other territories, they will see what Armenians have done to their lands, to the graves of their beloved ones, to the religious monuments. What will they feel? I, <laughs> I can predict. Uh, I felt the same, you know. And when I was approaching the line of contact during the war and was only able to see Agdam through, you know, lenses through binocle. And when I went there to all occupied territories, yes, I'm president, I must be, you know, in line with my duties, but we are all people, we have feelings. We can hide them, we can, uh, you know, control them, but sometimes it's very difficult. So I cannot predict what will be the, the uh, in the contrary, I can predict what will be the feelings of former Azerbaijani refugees, but as a president, as a person who 
looks to the future, we will do everything if Armenia has positive signals to us to try to build these uh, connections. And what already have been done from our side, unilaterally, I already mentioned, is a clear demonstration of that. And believe me, you know, we could have uh, not allowed any of these things happen, and nobody could have forced that, us. We did it deliberately. So this uh, is as far as the first question is concerned. With respect to the second question, we see some uh, signs and some very um, low voices in Armenian establishment about uh, reconsidering uh, their policy towards Turkey. Uh, even during the conflict, on several occasions, I was uh, talking about that, saying that this is absolutely uh, unacceptable and strange that such a small and uh, impoverished and weak country as Armenia has territorial claims such a great and powerful country as Turkey. They, uh, you know, were so much uh, under their ideological dogmas and uh, this uh, Turkophobia became a national policy that they even lost the feeling of, uh, of reality. And as far as I know, the Turkish government is um, <coughs> uh, you know, planning their steps in a very constructive way. But uh, of course, they need to have adequate, adequate response. First, what Armenia should do, they should uh, refrain from territorial claims against Turkey. They should rewrite their constitution. They should adopt new constitutions. They are planning to do it, but that's for political agenda of the government. The government wants to strengthen their political position. But at the same time, I think that I can give them a good advice to, to remove from the constitutional territorial claims to Turkey. I don't know in which country's constitution there is a territorial claim to other country. You know? uh, I think it's a unique situation. And everybody should understand that there have been wars and wars and wars throughout the history. And their uh, fake uh, history with respect to so-called genocide has nothing to do with reality. It was war, it was a situation when uh, uh, people were fighting with each other, countries were fighting with each other, but then there was a reconciliation. And uh, by the way, uh, at that time, Armenia not only had difficulties with the uh, Ottoman Empire, they had also difficulties with uh, other neighbors. And why they only selected Turkey for their unjustified attacks. So uh, Turkish government on several occasions publicly offered you know, some creation of some joint groups of uh, historians to look impartially, objectively to these issues. But they reject, because why? Because they need this fake history in order to get political dividends. They were exploiting this, uh, you know, fake story in order to get protection, in order now to get some assistance from uh, some countries. So uh, that's my position. Uh, at the same time, what I can add, of course, I cannot speak on behalf of Turkey, but what I can say, it's not a secret, that as you know, today we are discussing the uh, unblocking of communications, and uh, particularly Zangezur Corridor. And Zangezur Corridor cannot be unblocked without uh, Turkish uh, agreement and the participation. Though Turkey is not present in a trilateral working group on the level of deputy prime ministers of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia, but uh, Turkey is informed by us about what we discuss. And uh, if Armenia wants to put an end to uh, difficulties with communications, if they want to have any opportunity to become a transit country, it's only Turkey which can provide them with that. And as far as I know, Turkish government is ready. So again, the ball is on the Armenian side. They need uh, good doctors. You know, I said many times, they are uh, poisoned with poison. 
this poison mainly comes from the diaspora, which sits in a very quiet and nice places in southern France, in California, in Krasnodarsky Krai, in some other capitals, and enjoy their life. And they want those Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, in former Nagorno-Karabakh and in Armenia, to be their hostages and be their tools for them you know, to pursue some uh, ambitious and chauvinistic ideas. Armenian society needs um, to, to, uh, to destroy the Iron Curtain, <laughs> if I can talk about these analogies. They are living in the Iron Curtain, and they've been uh, you know, uh, you know, influenced by these poisonous ideas. And we are ready to help them with that. Uh, next speaker in our list, uh, Stanislav Pritchin, Academy of Sciences, Russian Federation. Mr. President, uh, it's a great privilege to be with you today. Thank you for your time. My question is about future of Azerbaijan. Uh, everybody knows that in less than two months, Azerbaijan will celebrate the 30th century, uh, anniversary of its independence. And uh, uh, by this time, probably Azerbaijan uh, has resolved the key uh, question, key goal for its independence, the restoring of uh, territory integrity. And uh, from my perspective, now the time to set up the long-term goals for the next 30 years. And in this regard, I would like to ask you how you, your vision of the future of Azerbaijan, which goals now Azerbaijan as a state uh, sets up for the future, how do you see Azerbaijan in 10, 20 years in regarding in terms of uh, GDP, uh, development of economic and uh, strategy generally as a state. Thank you very much. Thank you. In order to answer these questions, we need probably a special session for several hours. But uh, I try. I try to be very brief. Uh, we actually have uh, elaborated the mid-term and long-term development strategy for Azerbaijan even before the war. And of course, the liberation of territories will be additional opportunities. Because though the restoration of the territories will demand a lot of resources, but at the same time, these resources will be spent in Azerbaijan. They will stimulate business, they will stimulate the construction sector of our economy, they will create jobs, they will create opportunities, they will create additional values in agriculture. Therefore, uh, now uh, we, um, in a way, have two development programs. First is an annual development program uh, which we approve every year, and uh, also the development program until 2030. And the second is a development program for Karabakh reconstruction, which is now only in the phase of beginning. So now uh, our governmental structures work on a uh, combination or coordination between two in order not to spend twice for the same purpose. And for that purpose, in the liberated territories, we are now introducing an absolutely new model of governance. Uh, there will be different model of governance uh, of uh, presidential power, presidential administration, and uh, there'll be a very modern approach to um, development, not only in, during the reconstruction, but after reconstruction also. Therefore, we are now evaluating all our resources, uh, which have been uh, illegally exploited by Armenia. There is a big potential for mining in those areas. And by the way, we already started the legal procedures against uh, some so-called businessmen who were illegally exploiting our copper and gold resources uh, on the liberated territories. There's a huge potential for renewable energy, especially energy of uh, wind. And uh, in some parts of the liberated territories, for instance, Lachin Kalbajar, it's a huge potential for wind. In uh, Jabrail, uh, Zangilan, huge potential for solar. 
So that is, uh, and also uh, water. Um, now we got access to our main water resources after we liberated Lachin and uh, Kelbejar because most part of the water resources which Armenian population in Karabakh is using are uh, taking source there. We are now in the process of uh, uh, re restoration of 12 uh, hydropower stations, which Armenians destroyed uh, after war stopped until they left uh, Kelbejar. So within 15 days, they destroyed 12 hydropower stations. You know, that also demonstrates their uh, you know, feelings and their policy. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, want to create a very special living standards on those territories because people who will go back there will, they suffered for 30 years. They need to have decent life. Therefore, the, the first pilot project of a smart village already started. Uh, city planning already started. So Karabakh will generate a lot of uh, GDP in non-energy sector of our economy, also transportation, free airports uh, already are in the process. In one airport already works have started. Railroad connections, so Zangilan can become an important transportation and logistical hub, taking into account its location and uh, close uh, you know, proximity to the neighbors. Uh, with respect to the rest part of Azerbaijan, our main uh, strategy is to develop non-energy sector of economy. Uh, reforms which we implement bring good results. Mainly, we see these results in good governance. Uh, we have collected more tax and uh, custom duties these three months than we planned. The surplus is uh, around uh, 400, 500 million manat. So uh, our budget is based on $40 per, per barrel, and even if it's $30 per barrel, people of Azerbaijan will not feel it. So uh, industrialization, attracting more investments to uh, non-energy sector, business opportunities. You probably heard that the leading uh, rating agencies improved our ratings on the World Bank doing business um, report. We are number 28, uh, so business climate is improving. And uh, we have very um, educated people and young generation, which uh, now is generating ideas and it's uh, hope for the future. And as I said, during the war, the, the biggest burden of war was on the shoulders of those who were children when I came to power. So we managed to, uh, to help young generation to, uh, to develop. And uh, taking into account energy resources and completion of all major oil and gas pipelines, that will uh, feed our economy with additional sources of supply. We do not depend on foreign aid. Our foreign aid is something around 18% of GDP, and I put a target to reduce it to 10% um, of GDP, which will be then one of the best uh, results in the world. Uh, we have very low uh, rate of poverty, around 5%. When I came to this position, it was 49%. Uh, so we actually uh, feel that we will be able to implement all our plans, which is with a strategic vision. But for that, we need stability not only inside Azerbaijan, which we have for uh, already 28 years, but we need stability uh, beyond our borders. And now one of the main concerns will be uh, our steps in order to minimize risks. We have taken obligation of the chair of non-aligned movement with a great success. And uh, our international efforts in the region led to 
creation of new formats of cooperation, or really trilateral cooperation with Turkey, Russia, uh, Turkey, Iran, Georgia, Turkey, Russia, Iran. So this is also a um, contribution to stability and predictability. And of course, there should be zero risk of uh, revenge attempts from Armenian side. If they do it, as I said, we, we want peace, but we will destroy them completely. Destroy them completely and let them not forget what I say now. Uh, Svent Carnell, Institute for Security and Development, Sweden, and Svent Carnell joins us online. Svent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hermetli Janel, President. Uh, first of all, allow me to congratulate you and the people of Azerbaijan on the restoration of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. Uh, it is clear that this historic achievement has changed the politics of the Caucasus region and far beyond. Uh, most importantly, I think it has shown to the world the capabilities of Azerbaijan and the resolve of the Azerbaijan statehood. It has proven that Azerbaijan is not an object of some real or imagined geopolitical games between great powers, but actually a power and an actor in its own right. And I would add this is a trend we're seeing across the region with increasingly several states developing into real actors uh, such as Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan alongside with Azerbaijan. Uh, as this is becoming clear, Mr. President, my question is how will this impact Azerbaijan's foreign policy, uh, its relations with surrounding countries, including regional powers, but also the countries to the east of Central Asia with whom you share many interests? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments and for your congratulations with respect to restoration of territorial in integrity. And uh, you're absolutely right. We demonstrated our capacity, which uh, I'm absolutely sure was not known to many members of international community. Actually, uh, all these years, we were doing our homework in a quiet atmosphere. It was not that we were hiding something. No, everything what we've done was done openly. But we were not trying to uh, you know, advocate for us. We were not trying to make presentations, to make some PR uh, actions. We were doing what was right for the country, for the people, addressing a lot of social issues, resettling refugees, uh, providing devoted to the military building. We, I did not hide that we will uh, restore by force our territorial integrity if Armenia doesn't do it peacefully. So war was a kind of a concentrated uh, implementation of our capacity. And we never overestimated ourselves. We never thought that Azerbaijan is uh, number one or number ten issue on the agenda of the leading countries. No, they have and other issues. And we are, mm, we are fine with that, because the less big powers remember or think about us, the better for us. Uh, now, what will uh, happen and what is happening now? With respect to the uh, neighboring countries, relations uh, develop successfully, and the war demonstrated once again. I don't want to go into much details, but uh, basically, we are satisfied with, uh, um, with the behavior or actions of our neighbors. Of course, we are very grateful to Brazil and Turkey for a very strong political and moral support from the first until the last day of the war. But uh, with respect to our three other neighbors, our main uh, target was that them to be neutral. And uh, it happened to a certain degree, in some countries to large degree, but nevertheless don't want to go in much details. And after war situation also demonstrates that now our neighbors uh, share our views with the regional development. And by the way, uh, we already discussed it with uh, our neighboring countries and how the region should develop, what should be the projects of transportation, of logistics, 
uh, energy cooperation, trade, etc. So we don't have any division. Uh, it's true that Armenia did not yet publicly uh, declare their policy, but what they do de facto, I think, is also satisfactory. I mean the government. With respect to our neighbors across the Caspian, also relations were developing very successful, and with uh, each of them we have a special track of cooperation. The biggest part is related to transportation, because Azerbaijan, after completing all the transportation and logistical projects here, like railroad connection with Turkey, uh, seaport and uh, highways, became already important transportation hub. Though we are landlocked, but nevertheless, we participate actively on east-west and south-north transportation corridors, and now more countries are involved in these projects. So main area of our cooperation with our neighbors across the Caspian is transportation, but not only. We are uh, working very closely on uh, how to increase volume of mutual trade, how to uh, provide better opportunities for mutual investments. We'll continue to our questions. Uh, Mr. Khalid Taimur Akram, Pakistan Center for Global and Security Studies. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. President, uh, on behalf of uh, people of Pakistan uh, and Pakistan, I would first like to congratulate you on this victory. And uh, uh, people of Pakistan are very proud of you and uh, you have become a celebrity in Pakistan because every day you are in newspapers in Pakistan and uh, now even uh, in the international relations uh, departments of uh, various universities, big universities in Pakistan, they are studying the uh, Karabakh uh, war and the success of Azerbaijan. So, uh, in Pakistan, we are very proud of you and the Azerbaijani nation. So coming over to my question, sir. Uh, during the last 44 days war, Azerbaijan was fighting only in its own territory, precisely targeting the military positions and military equipment of Armenia and the occupied territories. But Azerbaijan was faced with the constant war crimes of Armenia. Armenia deliberately targeted densely populated areas and civilians of Azerbaijan uh, in the 44 days of war. We remember the ballistic missile launch to Ganja, Tartar, uh, Barda and other cities. And recently from the media we saw uh, that the remains of uh, uh, Iskander M uh, ballistic missile and uh, which was found uh, in Susha launched by Armenia. Before it was also mentioned by the Armenian Prime Minister too that Armenia has launched uh, Iskander M missile uh, on Azerbaijan during the war. This ballistic missile is very dangerous and uh, can carry a nuclear warhead also. What is your opinion on it and what should be the actions of the international community uh, on this action? Thank you. And sir, my last request is after this, I would like to have a picture with you. Yeah, sure, we'll do it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the, our cameraman took the note of that. Probably they should look for a place where we can have a picture together. Yeah, maybe you look and find us. Maybe outside, in front of the building. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the words of congratulations. Thank you to Pakistan. Uh, like to convey, ask you to convey my gratitude to the people of Pakistan for continued support during the war. And Pakistan was uh, among the countries which openly supported Azerbaijan from the first days of the uh, confrontation. And uh, until the last days, always Pakistan was on our side. We are very grateful to Pakistani government and Pakistani people for a very consistent approach to the issues related to our territorial integrity. Maybe our participants, many of participants do not know, but Pakistan is one of the very few countries which did not establish diplomatic relations with Armenia because of the aggression and occupation. And there are only very few countries like Pakistan. So we always are grateful for that. And this is a real sign of our brotherhood. 
Uh, and probably you know that during the war there have been many flags of Turkey and Pakistan in our cities. And it was, uh, we of course were telling who is supporting us and our people that was, was coming from the hearts of the people. With respect to the war crimes uh, committed by Armenia, it's not for the first time. They committed war crimes during the first Karabakh war, but at that time it was different informational, how to say, environment, and uh, many facts of atrocities and uh, barbarism were not uh, documented, or if documented, they did not reach the international audience. Therefore, they managed to hide their, uh, you know, war crimes. And uh, at that time, they were. It was not only Khojali, It was many other villages, like village of Agdaban uh, in Kalbajar. Not many people in the world know about that, but that was more or less the same. They were killing and burning innocent civilians, and many other uh, villages have been victims of Armenian barbarism. And during the Second Karabakh War, as you said, it was in front of the eyes of international community how they bombed our cities and villages. And not only with ballistic missiles, they were bombing with uh, uh, artillery and mortars every day. The city of Tartar, which is a small city, uh, they 16,000 uh, bombs were thrown on Tartar. They even bombed the ceremony of, uh, uh, on the cemetery, killing a family. They were bombing Barda, they were bombing Naftalan when they killed a family of five. They were deliberately attacking our cities and villages and they thought that they will stop us uh, by doing that. We did not do the same. We, we, we never hit any village or any city. We hit only, yes, military objects, which were in Hankendi, but we hit military objects. And using ballistic missiles on the sleeping city of Ganja was a clear indication of their barbarism, because that ballistic missile, it had a target. It was not by chance that it hit a residential compound. It was a targeted attack at night when people were sleeping, and not once, several times. And uh, also what they've done after that, they said it was not them. Officially, Armenian officials said it was not Armenians who did it. But then who did it? <laughs> who? Ourselves? You probably know that they even wanted to put the blame for Khojali genocide on Azerbaijan. They were inventing these stories and trying to persuade international community that Azerbaijanis themselves killed innocent victims in, in Khojali. And they did the same with respect to uh, Tochka U and Elbrus missiles. They even hit uh, Khizi, which is situated 100 kilometers from Baku. They wanted to reach Baku. They were attacking Gabala. Gabala is far away from uh, the area of conflict. So, uh, Barda, Agdam, Arjabadi, Fizuli, Guramboy, Naftalan, uh, Khizi, Gabala, you know, that's what they were doing. And they, they were ne no military installations. And of course, uh, the news about Iskander attack uh, was uh, a surprise for us when Armenian Prime Minister said that they used Iskender, but it exploited only 10%, everybody was laughing. Uh, probably he could not properly deliver uh, the message which he wanted to say. And when I was asked in the end of February, I said, I didn't say they didn't do it. I said we did not detect it. It's different things. And at that time, we did not detect it. But uh, after he said that, after former President Sarkisyan said that they launched Iskender, but he was regretting that they did not launch Iskender on our pipelines. You know, this war criminal Sarkisyan, whose hands are in blood of innocent victims of Hojali, was uh, accusing Pashinyan that they did not hit the pipelines. 
uh, then former uh, chief of staff of Armenian army, uh, Mavsisyan, or I don't remember his name, he said they used. And then we had a video footage how they launch Iskander missiles. And I gave instructions to, to search, and we found it. And why we didn't find it before, I don't know, because, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, snow in Shusha. After war, it started snowing. And uh, even when I was there in January, in February, it was snow. So after snow melted, it was found. So what happened after it was found is very strange. Uh, there have been a comment of the Armenian army chief of staff. He said that he cannot comment on that. How should we understand it? Yes or no? Probably yes. Because if it was no, he would have said, no, we didn't. If he said, I cannot comment, it means yes, they did it. There was a comment of the former defense minister of Armenia who said that he cannot tell it because it's a war secret. <laughs> you, you, you see the level of these people. You know, these people were people who were making decisions about, uh, you know, military actions. And saying that it's a war secret means that, yes, they did it. But uh, unfortunately, we did not get any answer from Russia. Because, as you know, Russian official representative of uh, Minister of Defense, when Pashinyan said that uh, they used it, said no. Well, Pashinyan is a prime minister of Armenia. He says we use it. And Russian official from Ministry of Defense says no, they didn't use it. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Russian Defense Ministry control Ministry of Defense of Armenia? Is that the meaning of what Mr. Konoshenko said? So when he said Armenia didn't use it, all Iskender are in the storage. How do they know? Do they control Armenian storage? If they control Armenian storage, then who is in uh, disposition of these missiles? Uh, then there was a statement of uh, press secretary of Mr. Putin, Mr. Peskov. He said that Iskander was not used. Iskander is here, you can go and see. It's about 15 minutes. I saw it myself yesterday at the military trophies park. It is not only Iskander, it is Iskander M which Armenia army could have never had. I can tell you more because uh, we've been waiting for a long time. I can tell you more because uh, this is a, such a sensitive issue that I cannot hide it from Azerbaijani people and from nowhere. I raised this issue during my telephone conversation with Mr. Putin on the 1st of April. Uh, this was not part of the official disclosure of telephone conversation because um, we gave the same disclosure of the conversation as they did. You can compare it. Uh, but I asked uh, this question and said that we need to know the answer. The people of Azerbaijan, they need to know the answer, what happened. And uh, it's already almost two weeks. On uh, April 4th, our defense ministry wrote official letter to Russian defense ministry uh, with this respect, providing them with photo, video, and other materials, asking for response. What are these rockets, missiles, and what happened? And it's already nine days have passed. There is no answer. A group of Azerbaijani journalists uh, wrote an open letter to Russian embassy in Baku. And this letter is open, probably you've seen. No answer. Iskender is here. Iskender M, which uh, was not supposed to be exported to anywhere. How did it get to Shusha? 
from where it was launched, who launched it. We are waiting for answers. Uh, I can tell you one more thing uh, that uh, to some questions, answers we already have. But we're waiting for official answers from Armenia because these uh, missiles were launched from the territory of Armenia. We know precisely from where, and uh, these questions must be answered. You know, it's a serious issue. It's not just ordinary missile. And it was uh, launched, uh, and how many of them were launched, we also know, and when and from where. But we need, Azerbaijani people need to have answers to these questions. <clears throat> Next speaker on our list, uh, Denis Samut, Links Organization, United Kingdom, and Denis is online. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much uh, for being uh, with us this morning and answering these questions uh, so comprehensively. Um, war is always a costly affair, and the 44-day war has resulted in the death of uh, thousands of people on both sides. Yet, uh, we also know that as a result of this war, hundreds of thousands of refugees and IDPs now have the prospect of uh, going back home. And that is certainly something that I think we can all celebrate. The war uh, and the results of the war have opened a number of uh, prospects for regional cooperation. Yet, uh, as I think you hinted already in your presentation, uh, there are still some unresolved issues. I want to ask uh, two questions. The first is, you have said many times that the Karabakh conflict is over now. Does that mean that Azerbaijan is renouncing to the use of force to regain what is left on, of Nagorno-Karabakh under Armenian control? And the second question is related to the 10th November trilateral declaration. So this declaration, we all agree, is of uh, great importance and uh, has the potential of changing the dynamic in the South Caucasus. Yet it remains a trilateral declaration. Does Azerbaijan consider uh, the idea that this trilateral declaration be embedded in a United Nations Security Council resolution that would uh, somehow give it global and international legitimacy and make sure that all the parties abide by this provision. Thank you very much. Um, I fully agree that the declaration of 10th November is of great importance and actually, though it's not a big declaration, but it actually covers all the important elements and also shows that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is over. Uh, frankly speaking, we did not think about any kind of international legitimization of this resolution. Uh, we were not approached by neither Russian nor Armenian uh, side with that respect. Uh, so that was not something which we considered. We saw that uh, declaration is signed and uh, Russian peacekeepers are there. The declaration is fully implemented. And uh, the most important is that it is being implemented. And most parts of this declaration already are implemented. Uh, with respect to UN Security Council resolutions, we know what happened to those resolutions which were adopted in 1993. Uh, they all, they've been on paper and would have been on paper maybe for 30 more years if we did not do what was right uh, on the battlefield. Therefore, um, what it will add to what we have we have declaration, Azerbaijan is implementing uh, all the items. Armenia uh, was forced to implement items of declaration with respect to return of the uh, remaining occupied territories. And Russia is uh, providing the peacekeeping, uh, you know, peacekeeping services. Uh, with respect to the use of force, um, you know, against the uh, uh, territory of Karabakh, which is now inhabited by Armenians, 
No, we don't have such plans. I said Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is over. It was resolved. Those Armenians who live now in the territory controlled by Russian peacekeepers, we consider them as our citizens. And what we've done so far with respect to um, our uh, humanitarian assistance, logistical support, demonstrate these intentions. I can tell you even more. Today, already there are um, contacts uh, on the level of some experts with respect to the issues related to water management. Because for many years, for 30 years, we were deprived from the water of Terta River because of the two water storages which were controlled by separatists. So one of those water storages have been liberated and now we have full access to Terta River water. And now, to a certain degree, uh, those who live uh, under Russian uh, peacekeeping uh, you know, control, they need more water cooperation with us. So it started. So in this respect also, Azerbaijan behaves constructively. Uh, but as I said, if uh, Armenia would plan uh, any kind of hostile operations against Azerbaijan, if uh, we see and we can see now everything what we need in Armenia and uh, everywhere, if we see that there is a 1% of the risk to Azerbaijani people or to our territorial integrity, we will use all our means in order to protect ourselves. But we will never in the future initiate any kind of hostile operations if we are not provoked. Uh, now, the George Chimradze, Georgian public broadcaster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for, for, the, for your time and for this meeting. And I would like to express my appreciations to the organizers to inviting me here and to having this opportunity to give you a question. Let me move you back to the cooperation, regional cooperation. And um, so soon after the war ended, Mr. President Erdogan of Turkey visited uh, Baku and he once again invited the question of the um, regional cooperation known as the six plus, three plus three uh, format, which, which is actually, um, uh, it, it counts about one decade, more than one decade of its existence, but uh, he, I believe that he decided that this is a good time to raise this question. So I would like to stress your um, uh, attention toward this cooperation and the prospect of this kind of cooperation, especially with the perspective of one particular one particular potential uh, participant of this uh, format. I, I, I speak a bit about Georgia, and you mentioned it before that you have discussed some kind of cooperation prospects with your colleagues from the regional countries, and how much do you believe that Georgia can participate in this kind of uh, project, in this kind of uh, cooperation um, uh, while it has uh, quite a complicated relations with Russia on one hand, and on the other, it has its aspirations to integrate in the Western community, and we know while that, uh, that the Western community and the regional big powers uh, relations so far are continuing to deteriorate it. Uh, thank you. I was actually supposed to discuss this issue uh, with Georgian Prime Minister yesterday, but unfortunately he got coronavirus. I wish him good health and soon as recovery. His uh, visit was scheduled on 12th of April, but of course after he got coronavirus it was postponed. Therefore I did not have a chance to talk to him directly about that. Uh, but as soon as he recovers we'll be waiting him to, to visit us. But with uh, uh, with other neighbors, uh, with President Erdogan, with uh, President Putin, uh, I discussed it openly, and also there have been discussion on the very high levels of officials of uh, Azerbaijan and Iran. And with uh, uh, and I, I see that there is no difference in our approach. Azerbaijan, Turkey, Russia, and Iran share the same approach. 
to regional cooperation. And the main area of concentration now is the transportation, because it's a situation which is called win-win. Everybody wins from that. Armenia silently is also in the boat, but publicly they say no, because of what I already said, this you know, disease which they need to treat. Uh, Azerbaijanophobia and uh, Turkophobia. So what could be the advantages of this cooperation for countries is, is very obvious. And I think Armenia is a country which also will get a big share of advantage because today they don't have a railroad connection with Russia. They don't have railroad connection with Iran. There was one uh, unrealistic plan to build a railroad from Armenia to Iran, but I think they calculated and saw that it will cost $3 billion. Good project, but who is going to pay? That's a question. So that project has been already abandoned. Uh, any possibility of connection uh, with a uh, Russian railroad for Georgia, I think, is not realistic because of, uh, you know, you know better because of what. And through Azerbaijan, it was not possible also. So if this project happens, Armenia will have access to Russia, to Iran, and also potentially uh, to Turkey by railroad. And uh, that will, of course, create additional opportunities for development of the country. Azerbaijan will connect its railroad with uh, Nakhchivan through the Ngizur corridor and with Turkey. Though with Turkey, we have already connections through Georgia, Bakud, Bilisi, Kars. And uh, Russia will have an additional connection with Turkey through the territories of Azerbaijan, Armenia and Iran with Armenia. And also that could be part of the um, south-north transportation corridor from Iran to Russia, because you probably know that the last segment of the railroad on Iranian territory, Astara Rasht, is not built. Uh, there are works are going on there. But we are planning to build a railroad connection to uh, our border with Armenia within the next two, maximum two and a half years. This is for sure will be built, uh, because already we allocated the budget and the work have started. As soon as it is done, and 40 kilometers of Zengizur also, but that should be done by Russian railroad, because uh, Armenian railroad belongs to RJD, Russian railroad company, and uh, we already got uh, information that they're planning to do it. So it's south-north corridor through uh, Armenia also, uh, through Nakhchivan, Armenia, Zangilan, etc. Uh, therefore, this is obvious advantages, and we, we need to work uh, in these directions. With respect to Georgia's reservations, uh, I heard about them. I, I cannot say anything about that. I need to talk to the Prime Minister to, to listen to his position. But uh, Georgia for us is a not only strategic partner, but a brotherly country, very close country, uh, country which today uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan play extremely important role uh, for European energy security. So uh, I think we can find a proper uh, format of cooperation. Our intentions uh, are that. With respect to tensions between Western countries and some regional countries, this is not something new. Uh, it has been always, it has kind of a periods of uh, aggravation, recession, but it's something which is permanent here in our region, so we are used to that. I don't think that um, this kind of uh, misunderstanding or confrontation or whatever will uh, seriously damage our plans. Uh, we all very well remember as some of our Western partners were acting against construction of Bakut Bilisi cars, trying to involve Armenia in this project so that the road goes not through Georgia but through Armenia. I remember when I worked in a state oil company of Azerbaijan how Western partners were advocating construction of the pipeline, not through Georgia but through Armenia. I'm a witness and participant of all that. And how uh, difficult it was for us 
to build this pipeline because uh, World Bank for one year stopped financing because of that. So, but did it change anything? No. And it will not change anything now. Therefore, I think um, those who do not support it, okay, let them not support it. We don't mind. But I don't think that any kind of uh, interference or attempts to, to, to stop us from that will succeed. Therefore, I invite all those who are hesitant to be part of that, because that could be also additional corridor to Europe. And actually, through Turkey, it will go to Europe. So everybody will benefit. Those who were against Bakudbilisi cars today are grateful to us for that. So I think it will be the same. But uh, we will, of course, take into consideration any possible Georgian reservations with this issue. Uh, Michael Reynolds, Princeton University, United States. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for taking the time to meet with us. Um, my, I and my colleagues are genuinely very grateful to you for taking, uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to sit with you vis uh, physically or virtually uh, to discuss Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's future in the future of uh, the region. I, I would also like to say that I very much share your faith in the youth of Azerbaijan. Uh, the students I've met at uh, ADA and other Azerbaijani universities have impressed me. And um, I hope that we can continue to develop uh, ties uh, with uh, the educational institutions in Azerbaijan. And I can say that I am genuinely, given the quality of Azerbaijan's youth, as well as the opportunities that have now been opened up for Azerbaijan and for the region uh, with Azerbaijan's victory, I'm genuinely uh, optimistic um, about the future of this country. And I am also uh, optimistic about the, the region. Uh, for my question, I'd like to return to the um, uh, issue of uh, territory that you uh, touched on in your uh, response to Nigar Hanim. As an outsider to this conflict, an outside, outside observer, I can say that I think one of the prime drivers of the tension between Armenia and Azerbaijan has been um, uh, the expansive Armenian claims to territory. Again, I don't need to, to tell you, but uh, just to go over it, first Armenia claims uh, the territory of mountainous Karabakh, then they started to claim uh, the territories surrounding provinces. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, uh, they also went on to then threaten the possibility of taking more territory from Azerbaijan. And then in August of last year, began revising claims to uh, Eastern Turkey. Um, this is, I think, delusional. Uh, it's irresponsible. It's extraordinarily provocative. And I honestly don't know how to describe it, perhaps, but as madness. Um, during the recent war, some Azerbaijanis uh, made reference to Yerevan and other parts of the territory of today's uh, Republic of Armenia as being Azerbaijani lands. And as an historian, I know that there is, in fact, uh, some historical truth to that claim. And I also understand that in the context of a conflict where one side, Armenia, is making these outlandish, uh, delusional, uh, claims uh, to vast amounts of territory, there may be utility in reminding them that, look, you're not the only one who can play this game. So I understand when um, uh, Azerbaijanis have, have, have said that sort of thing to, to Armenians. But when I look at things from the Armenian perspective, knowing their history and then the current state of the Republic of Armenia, which is very small, as, as you know, the population is tiny, they can barely populate their own country. Uh, this is one of the things about their claims to, uh, to all these vast territories, when they, they're barely able to hold on in their own country. And there are Armenians today who wonder if they're, even with the status quo, will they be able to sustain it? So my question is this, will Azerbaijan refrain from, from making uh, insinuations that the territory of the con concurrent Republic Armenia um, belongs to Armenians, or will we refrain from making insinuations that this land is historically Azerbaijani and that Azerbaijan might one day wish to take uh, that territory? Thank you. Thank you for your analysis. I fully share uh, your views that it is you, you found the right word, the madness, to you know, <clears throat> put forward territorial claims to Turkey and to, to the neighbors. Um, but, uh, but again, in the 21st century, you know, it's very unusual that one country with a very limited capacity, which can hardly provide normal uh, living standards for its uh, people, 
has territorial claims to a country which is 10 times bigger and 100 times more powerful. But again, it's, uh, I think, part of the psychology, psychology that was based on the feeling that the whole world owes them everything. And this psychology led them to this you know, humiliated situation which they are now situated. And still they think that everybody should help them. Uh, probably you know that uh, official Armenian government in their behind the doors discussions is accusing European Union for not helping them. They're accusing NATO being a member of ODKB, uh, kind of a counter NATO military organization. They're accusing NATO of not helping them. They're accusing Russia of not helping them. They, uh, they accuse everybody except themselves. They, they, they cannot understand that the problem is within themselves. They are the biggest threat to Armenia. The biggest threat to Armenia is now Armenian psychology. They need to change. And maybe this very painful lesson which we taught them, maybe that could be a turning point uh, in their understanding of reality and understanding that if you call yourself independent country, then the, the tale of your people is in your hand. If you want to be protected, well, it's clear they can join, to, uh, as they call it, uh, I don't know how to call it in English, Sayuzne Gasudarstva. There is a Sayuzne Gasudarstva, union state, yeah, union state between Russia and Belarus. Armenia, I know that some in Armenia talk about uh, Sayuzne Gasudarstva, union state. Then let them put down the flag and uh, you know, become gubernia of some other country, and then they will be protected. So this is uh, kind of addition to uh, what you've said. And you're absolutely right. First they said that Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent country, and then they started to publish maps of all the occupied territories, calling it Nagorno-Karabakh, changing the names of our cities and villages. And uh, uh, then uh, fri uh, trying to uh, you know, frighten us with this new war for new territories. It was the defense minister Tonoyan who was saying that Armenia is preparing for new war for new territories. So we showed what is new war for old territories, and now Tanayan was kicked out. And this is a lesson to all the rest, who still think that they can talk with us in this manner. Uh, we did, during the war, what was necessary. We went until those limits which were uh, right limits, and we did not do more than was needed. Uh, I understand that you uh, in a very diplomatic way, saying that some Azerbaijanis claim that uh, part of Armenia is uh, ancient Azerbaijani territory. Mean, you mean me, of course, I understand. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being so polite. <laughs> and thank you for this question, because it's also part of a manipulation uh, in Armenia that I have territorial claims. No, I don't. And I can tell it publicly. But at the same time, we need to know the history. And I fully agree with what you said about young generations. Sometimes young generations, they don't know the history. And uh, for instance, uh, even ourselves, our generation, we were taught fake history. Those who were presented by heroes during when I was studying at school were actually uh, criminals. And uh, uh, those who were eliminating Azerbaijani people, for instance, 26 Baku commissars. We were taught that they're heroes, they saved uh, our homeland, but they were criminals, Shaoman and others, who were uh, killing Azerbaijanis, conducting a massacre here, and many other you know, examples like that. Therefore, we don't want uh, this generation, young generation, also to be uh, not aware about the realities. So when I say that uh, Zangizur is an uh, ancient Azerbaijani land, this is truth. Zangizur was given to Armenia in 1920, 101 years ago. 
Before that, it belonged to us. Uh, when I say that uh, Goethe, uh, how they call Sevan now, is the lake where Azerbaijan is lived, it's also the truth. And it's enough to look at the map of beginning of uh, 20th century, and you will not find Sevan there, you will see Goethe. The same uh, with uh, Erevan. They destroyed the historical part of Erevan. It is uh, obvious fact. Uh, Azerbaijanis live there, including uh, my ancestors. So this is uh, the fact, but it does not mean that we have territorial claims. Yes, I can tell you even more. Maybe you know it, don't want to mention, or maybe you don't. I even said that we will return there. Yeah, I said that. But I didn't say we will return there on tanks. I said we will return. It means that, why not? If we are returning to Zangezur corridor, if we are using the road, why should not we return to Erevan? I think the time will come and we will do it. So once again, thank you for this question. It allowed me to make clarification and also to uh, present my position. We will remember our history, but we don't have any territorial claims against any country, including Armenia. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. President, for your precious time. We have the last three uh, speakers. Uh, Julian Chifur, Center for Conflict Resolution, Romania. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I'm very happy to come again to, to Baku and to see you. I will have uh, two questions. The first one goes on how do you think that EU, Romania especially, could help and assist the reconstruction in the region, including the modern Azerbaijani multicultural, multi-faith society in Nagorno-Karabakh, as well as the difficult part of the institutional integration and reconciliation. And my second question, is how do you, Mr. President, see Nagorno-Karabakh in five years from now with the Nakhchivan Azerbaijani territories corridor achieved with uh, Armenia integrated in the Turkish Azeri corridor transportation corridors with the retreat of the Russian troops from the northern part of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh with the control of the border by the Azeri in Lachin corridor. So if you can elaborate on that, thank you very much. Thank you. With respect to the first question, how EU can help, frankly speaking, I don't know, uh, because we were not approached yet from EU with respect to providing assistance with the reconstruction. Uh, therefore, what we plan now on the liberated territories is only based on our own budget. We did not uh, get uh, any message yet from any international uh, organization or any country with respect to assistance. So if they help, we'll be grateful. If not, anyway, we have to do what we have to do and we will restore those uh, territories. Uh, of course, the companies from uh, Europe, as I said, from EU space, they're already present there, but it's uh, company to company uh, cooperation. It's not the investments, it's, you know, the contracts. Uh, with respect to uh, what will be in five years in those areas, it's difficult to predict. We can predict what we will do in five years. We are now not completely finalized the uh, roadmap, but basically we know what will happen. I think in the coming uh, three years we will complete all the major infrastructure projects like um, railroads, highways, uh, power generation, water supply, and uh, will be in active phase of construction. Uh, we need to do everything properly, to plan properly, to have a proper master plan for all the liberated cities, to have proper master plan for reconstruction of villages, so that people who return there, they have decent means of uh, living, so they do not depend on the state, especially the area is very um, appropriate and the soil is good and water resources, so we want people who will li live there will be, so be financially independent. Uh, so we will be in active phase of construction. 
And um, I think by that time, the Zangezur corridor will be in operation, definitely, because we put a target of two to 2.5 years and construction of 40 kilometers of the road in the Mekri district uh, will not take more than that. Of course, if there is a coordination and if Armenia do not put artificial obstacles. Uh, with respect to uh, what will happen after uh, Russian peacekeepers leave, well, uh, today there is a state border between Armenia and Azerbaijan in Tovuz, Kazakh, Akstafa. There are no peacekeepers there and nothing happens. I can tell you even more. Uh, Azerbaijani uh, border servicemen are now standing five meters from Armenian villages in Zangilan, in so the famous uh, village of Shurnuhu, which Armenians claim that it is there, but then when they looked at the map, they realized it's part on Azerbaijani territory. And we sent our border security there, and uh, I said to them that they go, they stand on the line, and uh, they, should, they do not cross the line, and they do not touch uh, Armenians who live in this village. And even uh, those Armenians who had to leave the territories, part of Shurnuhu village, we gave them time. And now, I can tell you, Armenian army demolished. They don't, it does not exist. Armenian border service, uh, I, so no one can stop us from taking control of this Shurnofu village. Do we do it? No. Do we plan to do it? No. And this is the answer what may happen. Because today, I think uh, this example demonstrates our will. The same on these 21 kilometers of the road which uh, connect the uh, city of Kafan with uh, Erevan. It crosses our territory. Yes, we put our border security there. We put even a poster, welcome to Azerbaijan. I don't know why it irritated Armenians so much. We just wanted to welcome them on our territory. It's our territory. Uh, but they were shooting to that poster. After that, we had to you know, respond to that. So they are using this road, yes. Are they protected by peacekeepers? No, only in two places. There are two posts. Can we cut this road? Yes. Do we cut it? No. So I think this is the answer. But of course, if Armenia behave as they behave now, because now they are totally demoralized, disorganized, there is no army, there is no way even to think about uh, revenge, but therefore I said that we are very concerned when uh, they have negotiations with Russia on modernization of Armenian army. And this concern was delivered to Russian officials, uh, modernization, why? Uh, any possibility for revenge will only create unnecessary tensions. Therefore, if the situation continues like that, I think there will be no problem living side by side. On many occasions, I, as example, mentioned Georgia, where Azerbaijanis and Armenians live not only in the same region, but sometimes in the same village, and nothing happens between them. Brenda Schaffer, University of Haifa, Israel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hajiev, and uh, thank you, Mr. President, and congratulations on restoration of justice uh, to the refugees of Azerbaijan, and I hope for an easy or at least peaceful Ramadan to the families of the, the martyrs. Um, from independence, Azerbaijan succeeded in building an exceptional, uh, modern, and highly capable military force. The second uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan war is being studied as a model of 21st century warfare, with Azerbaijan having demonstrated possession of highly skilled special forces and not only possession of modern technologies,
but unique integration of the, and application in the integrated battlefield of, of these technologies. Um, in the 1990s, I visited Azerbaijan. It was hard to get people to even to go to the battlefront, to go to the military. By this war, um, you had people standing in line, being turned away, volunteers from going to the military. Um, my question is, what are, what are, Mr. President, what are your lessons for the building of a modern uh, high-level uh, military? What were the changes that happened in Azerbaijani society that created this swell of support for the Azerbaijani uh, military? And while many think the war began in fall or late September 2021, did it really begin with the attacks, in to Armenian attacks in Tovuz, um, as you said, according to the doctrine of new wars from new territories, were they really, that was the stage one of the war and the September uh, battles were uh, the continuation of this war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your congratulations. And you, as a person who knows Azerbaijan for a long time, you, of course, have a lot of information and a lot of uh, opportunities to compare, and you're absolutely right. The difference between Second and First Karabakh War was particularly what you said. People were standing in the line, and even those, because we uh, announced partial mobilization, and that was uh, to certain uh, age, age groups were recruited. Those who were not filling those criteria were complaining. And I know many cases that uh, our people were complaining and wrote a letter why they do not take me. I also want to go to fight. I also want to defend our motherland. And, uh, you know, I think this is the main factor of our victory. Of course, we built a strong army. We did a lot of trainings. We bought a lot of sophisticated weapons, which helped us a lot to win and to save lives. Because without those weapons, we could have had much more, uh, much more victims. We had, uh, I think, two and a half, three times less, uh, less lost lives than Armenian army, taking into account that we were on the counteroffensive and we were going from down to, to the hills. The main factor was that even those mm, young people who never seen those lands. Uh, they, uh, their parents were, you know, uh, born there. They, you know, fought as if they were fighting for their own homes. We've seen a unity of all the peoples who live in Azerbaijan. This is also one of the biggest assets. On many occasions, uh, conducting international events on multiculturalism and cultural diversity, I always was saying that one of the biggest assets of Azerbaijan is a multicultural, uh, multi-face society. And during this war, representatives of all the nationalities, all the ethnic groups were fighting, uh, you know, until the last drop of their blood. They're fighting for their motherland. So it was such a strong consolidation, such a strong consolidation of Azerbaijani nation which consists of representatives of different ethnic groups, but which are united by the feeling of motherland, by our language, by uh, our statehood. So really, I was uh, very proud, and I am very proud now, that uh, we managed to, to, grow, to grow these people. Because, as I said, most of those who were fighting and who lost their lives were children when I came to power in 2003. But uh, always Karabakh was number one item on all agendas, inside the country, outside the country, on all international events, whether related to war and peace or related to social economic development. Karabakh was always priority in my comments. And uh, this is really uh, a new Azerbaijan. Armenians did not uh, know us well. They thought they are going to fight with Azerbaijan of 92. But Azerbaijan is different. People are different. Society is different. Motivation is different. They thought, and I know it exactly, 
their previous leaders thought that we will forget, that time will pass, everybody will be tired, nobody wants war. There have been such, a, you know, speculations some, sometimes in international media that Azerbaijan will never start anything because the country is developing, they will never risk, President Ali will never risk stability for some uncertain advantage. But they did not understand what is inside uh, us, what is in our soil. They did not understand that Karabakh, for all of us, is more than land. Karabakh uh, is our dignity, is our uh, destiny, it's our, uh, it's our blood, you know. And that's why uh, we demonstrated heroism, demonstrated courage, and we went until the end and no one could have stopped us. Though you know that there have been many attempts to stop us uh, from different sides, but mm, we went until the end. Uh, what happened in July mm, was another provocation of Pashinyan, because Pashinyan was considered not to be part of this military uh, gangster group. Therefore, uh, previous leaders of Armenia were always uh, treating him uh, like, uh, like a person who did not serve in the army, like a person who is weak, who uh, doesn't have courage, etc. Therefore, he wanted to have military victory. And uh, especially after they lost uh, in Nakhchivan just a month after he came to power, but that was not his blame because he just came to power. He wanted uh, military victory. We know exactly that they were planning uh, to retake Lalatapa, the territory which we gained during the April 2016 war. And he was trying to demonstrate that, yes, the previous regime of Sarkisian lost those territories and brave Pashinyan, chief commander, uh, retakes it. And by the way, now, when they themselves start to understand more about the war, they start to publish articles and uh, making statements that their attempt during the war to retake Lela Tepe caused them a lot of lives and actually part of the army was totally destroyed, totally destroyed there. In July, they wanted to occupy territories in Tovus. It is clear because we were accused by them that two of our soldiers with the UAS car came to attack their positions. This is ridiculous. We demonstrated during 44 days what our army is. If we wanted to take those lands, we would have taken it <laughs> first. And since why should we take the lands uh, of Armenia? Why should we give Armenia a chance to apply to ODKB for uh, military support? Are we crazy? No. They wanted to take the lands, and so Pashinyan could come there and said, I'm a brave commander of an un unbeatable <laughs> Armenian army. I came here and stand in Tovus. That's what they wanted. And we pushed them back. And when we pushed them back, I can tell you even more, we could have moved forward because uh, they killed our general. Uh, they killed our officers. And uh, we, we had to take revenge. But I stopped our army. Uh, we did not cross the border. We just kicked them out of our territories and stopped. Though already there in Tovuz mountains there was no Armenian troops. We could have easily went kilometers ahead. But I said, no, the time hasn't come. Then they did another in uh, August in, in uh, Göranboy. They sent a group uh, to penetrate our positions and the head of that group was detained. Uh, and then September. So uh, that's because, again, because of misunderstanding, uh, miscalculation, overestimation of themselves and underestimation of Azerbaijan. But they made a fatal mistake. 
and they now have to pay the price for that. We can try Amanda Paul once again. Amanda? You yes, can... I hope you yes. Yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Now better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Hikmet, and thank you very much, um, President Aliyev. It's a great pleasure to join you um, here this morning. I'm based in Belgium. I, I want to ask a question about the EU. Many in Azerbaijan um, criticized the approach of the EU um, during... Um, how could the EU regain its credibility and influence in the post-war period? Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I didn't see any serious criticism of uh, EU during the conflict. Uh, neither myself nor any of our establishment criticized EU as uh, EU. I uh, received a phone call from the President of European Council during the war. He expressed concern about that, what happens, so we, we discussed. I informed him about the situation. Uh, yes, we had, uh, there have been criticism um, about some EU leading member states, but they acted in their national capacity uh, in the, uh, you know, during the war, but not as a EU member states. Therefore, with respect to EU, it's now Armenia who is criticizing EU for not helping, but it's a big question how EU could have helped. Thought EU should have sent the troops there or what? I don't know. So, uh, with respect to post-conflict uh, development and uh, EU role, I said already, we did not get any messages from EU how they want or plan, if they want or plan, to help us with the reconstruction, with resettlement of refugees. It will be a huge uh, task for us, not only from only point of uh, financial resources, but from uh, methodology. We will be never in this situation when we have to you know, recover the territories which are leveled to ground. And uh, there could be some international experience to give us advice how to properly plan it, what could be the uh, steps in what in which conse consequence um, the steps must be taken, and of course, if uh, international organisations, including EU, will consider any provision of any assistance, will be uh, grateful. I can tell you even more uh, with re with regard to pandemic. Our negotiations with EU a little bit uh, were frozen on the new agreement, but I already publicly said that uh, as soon as now COVID is over, more or less, situation will be more stable, we will restart. It's a big part of that agreement have already been agreed. It's only some seven, eight percent needs to be agreed. Therefore, we are planning to continue our close cooperation with EU and even those uh, uh, member states uh, of EU which during the war and after war are attacking us. I think they also need to, some of them already, make changes in their attitude. Uh, after war, I can tell you there was only one EU member state whose foreign minister allowed himself very improper comments about Azerbaijan. But uh, we almost kept silent, only our foreign ministry responded because we were very afraid of this country. This really, I, I advise you also to be very afraid of this country which uh, attacked us brutally. And I told all our officials, keep silent, otherwise they will come and occupy us. Do you know which country is that? The country is called Luxembourg. Uh, yeah. And uh, I can tell you just for, for comparison, the territories which we liberated uh, is a territory of four Luxembourgs. So therefore, foreign minister of Luxembourg better take care of himself and stop this insinuation. But apart from that, after war, there have been nothing negative, And uh, we hope that EU will continue to be our big partner, especially, as I said before, with nine members of EU, we already have strategic 
partnership format of cooperation. Thank you, Mr. President. Amanda Paul was on the last speaker in our list. Mm. On behalf of our entire group, I would like to extend our uh, warmest appreciation in regards for the time that you have spent together with us, your valuable and precious time, and you have provided us with a guidance and vision and thoughts, and based on that, uh, together with Ambassador Havis Pasha, we'll continue our discussion, and we're also looking forward to visit Trophis Museum in beautiful Baku Boulevard. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask maybe someone else has questions. Thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, for being generous with your time. Uh, thanks to your generosity, I have, the, I have had the opportunity to say a few words and to ask you a short question. Um, first, I'd like to begin um, adding my voice uh, to the uh, to the messages of congratulations uh, on your great victory, which uh, has certainly um, uh, destroyed the Armenian mythology, if you like, and restored not only Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, but also Azerbaijan's psyche and psychology. It has boosted it, which is very important. And I would like to perhaps, uh, as I uh, earlier, in our earlier discussion suggested, it would be a good idea for experts and uh, academics to look into the uh, psychological, political psychological side of the whole event. You know, how does a, a sort of um, a delusional psychology work in terms of creating a fake political culture which certainly influences the uh, policy making in a country like Armenia. We certainly saw it in the case of Greece after, for instance, um, the Turkish great victory in 1922. They go through enormous traumas and then it is not easy for those countries to get over those traumas. But, you know, um, in the end, one way or the other, even if the circumstances and the factors that uh, shape all that are different, one way, or, one way or the other, they will have to come round to the reality. And, I'm, uh, and I think it would be a good idea on that. Um, and the other thing uh, I'd like to ask uh, is about the uh, rest, uh, restoration of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. So the war has provided that. But there are some, uh, not sticking points, but um, the, do you have a timetable about what to do with the restoration of the Azerbaijan's sovereignty over those little bit of territories, not little bit, but in certain parts of Karabakh area? Um, do you have a timetable uh, that you may have agreed with the Russian peacekeepers and others, or are you going to take things as they come up uh, in order to restore Azerbaijan's sovereignty? perhaps through a step-by-step -step approach. But again, congratulations on your great victory, uh, on, on, uh, which, which basically uh, gave, us, uh, gave uh, all of us great happiness in Turkey and across the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for congratulations, for support. We felt support from Turkey, of course, from the uh, leader of the country, from <coughs> president, from uh, high-ranking officials, from uh, NGOs, from media, from the whole Turkish society. So it was a unanimous, a very strong support, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, I think that um, I think that it will take time for Armenia to adjust themselves to a new reality. Psychologically, they are not prepared for that because, as I said already, they've been manipulated and they've been brainwashed and they created a kind of a fake uh, history for themselves, which they never had. Uh, I don't want to go into much details, but even those histor their historical heroes do not belong to their nation, whom they pretend to have. And the history of the 20th century is completely fake history. And they were uh, trying to persuade each other, and probably their biggest problem is that they managed to persuade each other about what they have not been never and what they plan to have. Otherwise, uh, before the war, they wouldn't have, uh, on the high level, 
president and I think prime minister were talking about the SERF agreement. They were talking about territorial claims to Turkey. One should be crazy, you know, <laughs> to talk about that and to plan it. And I remember several years ago when uh, then president, uh, criminal president Sarkisian was asked at some meeting with uh, young Armenians that uh, when we will return to our ancient land in, uh, you know, in Turkey, and what he said, he said, our generation uh, achieved this victory. It's for your generation to do that. And now where is Sarkisian? He, he ran away from Karabakh. He was there during the war. He came there, but then he ran away, along with Kacherian, who were considered to be war heroes. They're cowards. And the former uh, defense minister, Aganyan, who lost his uh, leg in the first Karabakh war, and he could have lost his head in Shusha if he didn't flee Shusha just a couple of days before, before we came. Uh, so this is their psychology. And uh, they were raised that they are the greatest nation in the world. They deserve the whole uh, you know, universal support. Everybody owes them. Nobody knows for what. And they were exploiting their fake stories in order to get some personal and corporate advantages. Then now, when everybody understood that the army does not exist, that they had 10,000 deserters, 10,000 you know, unbeatable army, the whole their uh, perception changed. This is a trauma, you're absolutely right, psychological trauma, but who is responsible? themselves. Not only those who were in power, but the whole society is responsible. They need to open their eyes to understand that they will have to live in this environment. They are more and should be more interested in establishing relations with Turkey than Turkey. Turkey can live without with this border closed forever. <laughs> For me it's necessary. We can live forever. We, for instance, we talk about Zengizur corridor, yes, it will have connection with Nakhchivan, but don't we have connection now? Yes, we have. It will be for them, and they need to make this change. But uh, if you ask me, is there anyone in Armenian political class who would realistically treat the situation? No. Even if there is such a person, he or she will never do it publicly. Because immediately will be under attack. Immediately will be under fire. He will be called Turk as an insult in their language. He will be called traitor, uh, etc. With respect to the timetable of uh, sovereignty, I think I already said that Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is over. Those uh, Armenians who uh, live now uh, under Russian peacekeeping uh, forces control uh, as I said before, we consider them Azerbaijani citizens. It's a matter of time of reintegration of this region. Uh, we are, will not, uh, how to say, push too hard because uh, we've done what was right. And uh, uh, I think these people themselves will understand that for them it is better to have uh, normal relations with their neighbors. And uh, even now, when logistical, whole logistical support to those territories goes through uh, Barda and Agdam, once again, it is clear that this is a region integrated with Azerbaijan. Lachin Corridor did not exist 100 years ago. There have been no roads in Lachin and in Kelbejar until 1930s. People could go only by horses. And uh, of course, this region had no connections with Armenia. It was fully integrated with the rest part of Azerbaijan, economically, socially, in every way. And it will be like that. That's, uh, that's uh, how to say, reality. Uh, and we're ready. We have thousands of Armenians who live in Azerbaijan now. As I said, <laughs> during the war, the, uh, the sister of the former Armenian defense minister lives in Azerbaijan. And she lived in Azerbaijan while he was a defense minister and while he was a, uh, you know, 
uh, occupying our territories, and no one even pointed a finger on her. This is our culture and our uh, policy. So, uh, full uh, integration of Karabakh region is inevitable. It will happen, but we need to do it on time and uh, with maximum patience. Yeah, please, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm Vali Kaliji from Tehran, Iran. Uh, Azerbaijan is uh, successful uh, retaking of the provinces of uh, uh, Fizuli, Jebrail, and Zengalan, uh, transformed the de facto status of 138 kilometers uh, section uh, of the border with Iran. Therefore, uh, an Armenian de facto state has been replaced with a de jure state, Republic of Azerbaijan. Now we can uh, uh, work each other on different uh, issues, including border management and fulfillment of Khodafarin Dam and its hydropower plant. These developments are positive. Uh, but on the other hand, there are many questions uh, about establishment of uh, Nakhchivan Crater to Republic of Azerbaijan in, inside of Iran. Uh, also, Azerbaijani and Turkish officials uh, have repeatedly uh, spoken about these uh, creators, uh, especially the non-cutting of the Iranian-Armenian border. Um, uh, many Iranian people and experts are worried about uh, this creator. The question is, what uh, will be the real wide of this creator? This creator will be only the connection of citizens of the Nakhchivan and Azerbaijan, an internal creator, how will be it become our international creator? Will this creator be limited to human passage and transfer of the goods? Or will be the military uh, equipment also pass through it? These questions arise from that fact that the boats of 750 kilometers border between Iran and Azerbaijan and 30, 38 kilometers border between Iran and Armenia are important to us. And we hope that, uh, Mr. President, clarify and uh, uh, frankly answer to the aforementioned questions that I can transfer your answer to my uh, Iranian colleagues in inside of uh, Iran. Again, thanks for your kindness and great hospitality. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned a very important question, and I want to clarify on our position. Of course, I can talk only on behalf of Azerbaijan because it's uh, when it's corridor, it's several countries. Therefore, there should be a, a consensus on that. But uh, this uh, restored border with Iran opens new opportunities. And you mentioned about Khudafarin you know, water storage and dump. As you know, uh, we signed an agreement uh, with Iran on that during one of my visits to Iran. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, here in Azerbaijan, some of the, uh, our critics were trying to accuse Azerbaijan for that saying that why Azerbaijan signed this agreement, because Azerbaijan does not control the situation. But they could not understand that by signing this agreement, once again, though on, in many documents, Iran strongly supported our territorial integrity. Once again, that was a demonstration that Iran considers this territory as sovereign territory of Azerbaijan. And from practical, that's political side, from practical point of view today, when we control the border, Khudafarin Dam is also kind of a, our joint asset. And already I can tell you that we started to uh, cooperate with Iranian side on creation of the power plant, water uh, hydropower plant of 200 megawatts. And uh, that will be divided by two pieces 
and Azerbaijan already with Iran agreed on the, uh, on the methodology of uh, reimbursement of the uh, investments because all was done by Iran. So we have to repay and put uh, on the table our share. So that also has been agreed. Um, with respect to the concerns of the uh, border, I think these concerns are absolutely groundless. And there have been such a concerns in the beginning of uh, post-war period, but uh, you know that there have been high-ranking delegations from Iran visiting Azerbaijan, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, and we broadly discussed, I personally, with both of them, with Mr. Zarif and with Mr. Arakchi, broadly discussed our views of that, and I think we found a common ground for that. And I know that uh, after that, they also had uh, visits to Russia, discussing the same issues, to Turkey. And we have full consensus. So Iran strongly supports this project. Moreover, Iran strongly supports the 3 plus 3 format of cooperation, which practically the main issue now is, is this. It will in no way cut uh, Iran from Armenia. Uh, it, is, it will be a kind of railroad connection, highway connection, but there are many railroad and highway connections on our borders, so it doesn't mean that it will cut or, or damage some uh, interests. On the contrary, it will allow Iran to, through Nakhichivan Railroad, to go to Yerask and then to Armenia and to have a railroad connection. Yeah, you wanted to ask something? No? Yeah. So, uh, therefore, I, I think that uh, from uh, Iranian government, we have full support to this project. I think it will be also good that uh, Iranian think tanks, uh, civil society, and politicians also know, so that they know the true story. With respect to the transportation of uh, goods and passengers, it's a matter of time. Uh, there is a provision in our trilateral uh, declaration, uh, and after discussions already took place several times in the joint working group, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, on the level of deputy prime ministers, that security on Armenian territory will be provided by Russian border security forces, which, as you know, control Armenian border with Iran and with Turkey. So for Iran, it will be nothing new. It's still Russian. When Iranian cross the border with Armenia, the first whom they see is Russian border security. So the same will be with the corridor, so it will not create any difficulties. And with respect to military or um, civil cargos, you know, today we supply military cargos to Nakhchivan through Iranian territory uh, by existing lines. So why not through this? It will not make any difference. And plus, the war is over now. So we don't need now to think about that. Need to think about peace. Good morning. I'm Stephen Klein from Tel Aviv University in Israel. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, my, my two questions, the, the first is about messaging. Um, you talked earlier about the, the solidarity in Azerbaijani society. I think uh, we can see it. I, you know, I've seen a lot of these signs around the country. Um, you know, things like Shusha is ours, Karabakh is our Azerbaijani. I saw a big sign with a hashtag, don't believe Armenia. Um, so I think that, you know, that, that it's, it's important. I can understand that from Israel when, you know, we, we've experienced that too, the messaging that comes down to the people. And the messaging has create, created a very strong commitment towards Karabakh. At the same time, you can imagine, I mean, I've talked to Azerbaijanis who feel hostility towards Armenians, and justifiably so. Um, but it also makes Armenians feel unsafe, particularly those in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, we know that uh, you can make what's called an emo you can try to make what's called an emotional deposit. You do a, the gestures that you've done for Nagorno Karabakh, and for, for um, you know with the, the you know using Azerbaijani territory, it's done as a positive gesture. But when it's done at the wrong time, it can be an emotional withdrawal because they're they're still feeling the trauma that you've also spoken of and, and recognized. So my question here is. Um, 
now that Karabakh is under Azerbaijani control again, what, how will the messaging change? You know, what, what's going to next be on those billboards instead of saying Shusha is ours and Karabakh is Azerbaijani? What will the next message be to, to create a new narrative where um, Azerbaijanis feel less hostile towards Armenians and the Armenians of Karabakh will feel safe enough that they won't want to leave when the time comes to live under full Azerbaijani sovereignty um, authority. My second question is, is about uh, the status of women, uh, which we haven't addressed with, in that uh, the status of women, according to the research, is highly correlated with economic development and peace. Um, and I understand that Azerbaijan's made a lot of progress in the last 20 years or so uh, in that um, uh, role, but sometimes closing that gap, y you can make a lot of progress here, closing that gap further gets harder. Um, so I wanted to know how you see that and, and what you see um, the government's role in in, um, in furthering advancing the status of women so that they can, there can be more diversity, more women around the table you know, making decisions, which, which shows, uh, according to the research, will, will contribute to post-conflict development and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will start from the second question, uh, because women are always a priority, so you will understand <laughs> me. Uh, I think that the role of women in Azerbaijan is pretty high in different uh, segments, in different sectors of our life, and that was a historically. The respect to women is a kind of a historical tradition of uh, Azerbaijani people. And uh, as you probably know, one of the first decisions of the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, which was established in 1918, was to give the right to women to vote. It was 1918. And emancipation of uh, women at that time was uh, one of the priorities. And really, today, uh, I think the achievements are obvious. And for me, frankly speaking, it's uh, uh, sometimes it's strange when uh, Azerbaijan is perceived as a country where women do not have enough rights or women's rights are deteriorating or the kind of a discrimination, not at all. Uh, the fact that there's not many women here is because it's, we have guests here. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's your table now. But uh, women in Azerbaijan, they have very high ranking positions and you know, chairman of parliament and even higher position is also <laughs> held by women. So I think that, uh, and with respect to reconstruction, of course, we count very much because women uh, usually in Azerbaijan, they are working in the sectors of education and healthcare, and that will be the first priority on the liberated territories. The first hospitals, the first schools, that's what we plan to build in the first place. Therefore, uh, women will be provided with, with this in job. With respect to uh, these slogans and billboards, you know, Karabakh is Azerbaijan was said by me at the uh, Valdai conference in Sochi. Uh, why? Because uh, Prime Minister of Armenia, Pashinyan, being in Karabakh on a rally, said that Karabakh is Armenia and period. That was the end of negotiations. That was wrong, first. It's not true. Second, that was contradicting his own previous statements when he was saying that Karabakh is an independent country. So how can it be Armenia and independent country at the same time? Well, it's a question to Mr. Pashinyan, which he has to, probably now no need to ask him any, anymore. Uh, and uh, when I was, had a chance to speak on the conference, and that was live, uh, I could have said it in Baku, and maybe not many people would have heard it, but I said it live on Russian TV, uh, that Karabakh is uh, Azerbaijan and excl exclamation mark. And that immediately became a hashtag, how do you call it, a yes. slogan. <laughs> and therefore that was the main slogan for our victory, for all my statements, and that's why we see it everywhere. And probably this will continue because this is true. Karabakh is Azerbaijan. Uh, but with respect to the new billboards, I already said about one. We put one, welcome to Azerbaijan. 
on the road which Armenians consider to be their road, but it also irritates them. I don't know what to write. When we write, Karabakh is ours, they are not happy. When we write, welcome to Azerbaijan, they are not happy. Probably they need to have this post-traumatic period to be treated well, and as I said, by politicians and by international community to guide them, uh, to adjust themselves with a new reality. But uh, during the war and after war, we completely refrained from any hostile rhetorics. My uh, comments and statements and uh, messages to Azerbaijani people were always uh, added that Armenia should give us a timetable for withdrawal and we will stop war. And it happened. So we did not do something which was wrong. We did only what was appropriate and on time. Is that Chagra Erhan? Chagra Bay Sism President. Chagra Erhan. I'm a member of Presidential Council of Security and uh, Foreign Policy Issues. Uh, I would like to also congratulate you personally as the Ali Bash Commandant of Azerbaijan Army and each and every member of Azerbaijani nation who uh, won this victory, a highly precious victory. You mentioned uh, Azerbaijani people had Turkish flags among with Azerbaijani flags in Azerbaijan cities, but I'm sure you also know in every Turkish city we had Azerbaijani flags uh, throughout these 44 days of war. Uh, we celebrated the victory as we are Azerbaijani uh, citizens in Turkey as well. So this uh, period of high cooperation between Turkey and Azerbaijan showed that the sentence that uh, two states, one nation, was not only a rhetoric, but is also a, a reality. Uh, and we commemorate uh, late Haider Aliyev with his leadership in this moment. Uh, I would like to ask a very short question. After the current uh, developments and current situation and new dynamics in the region, do you think uh, there is a need for this group? And what would be the functions if there will be a mixed group, new functions? Should they renew their functions and their existence? What is the aim of this uh, 30 or 25 years old group now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words and uh, for congratulations. Uh, we know that in Turkey our victory was uh, received as a victory of all of us and we are very grateful for such a strong brotherly support, as I said, from all segments of Turkish society from ordinary people, from everyone. So we felt this solidarity and support which gave us additional power and, and strength. Uh, with respect to the Minsk Group, I met the ambassadors of the Minsk Group after war, and I told them that uh, when they were asking me how I can see their future, I asked them to give me some proposals because it was basically Minsk Group, uh, the group which always was giving proposals. Of course, based on positions of Azerbaijan and Armenia, but elaboration of principles and uh, uh, topics on the table were elaborated by them. And of course, the internal, how to say, composition and internal relations within Minsk group were always their priority. Therefore, uh, first of all, um, we need to know what is the position of the co-chairs, Russia, United States, France, how they see the Minsk Group uh, future functioning, because it's them, actually, who are co-chairing this group. Uh, we think that the conflict is resolved, and that's our position. Is there a room for a group which was supposed to help to resolve the conflict after the conflict is resolved? I don't know. <laughs> At the same time, uh, I am not in a position to say we don't need mini group any longer, go away, no. Why should I? Therefore, I uh, diplomatically ask them to think about, to show creativity 
They've been so creative during all these 29 years. <laughs> so show, show some more creativity. And, uh, but, but I think if <laughs> you talk seriously, there could be uh, some areas where they can uh, play their role because as, as a post-conflict situation, not as a group which needs to help to resolve the conflict. And here I completely disagree with some of the representatives of the Minsk group countries that the conflict must be resolved. It already has been resolved. If I say that it is resolved, it means that it is resolved. If Armenia says that it is not resolved, then, then <laughs> I can ask the Armenian side how they see the resolution, what should we do. So uh, I think that they need to think something for themselves, to be creative, to be supportive, uh, not to do something which can uh, damage this fragile uh, peace, uh, not to give uh, some unrealistic promises to Armenia, and to, be, to try to be uh, neutral, to try to be impartial, and to try to seal this uh, situation. And uh, when I talk about future peace agreement with Armenia, if Armenia would consider this option, then there could be a lot of room for international players. The issue of demarcation, delimitation, uh, interaction. So uh, we are part of international community. We are part of OEC. And uh, OEC has a very special role in, in the region. Therefore, I think that they can be useful. But uh, it's been uh, quite some time that they did not, do not visit us. I hope they will come soon with some proposals. And we will definitely look at these proposals with uh, due attention. Yes, Taras, please. Um, it was uh, congratulations as well um, on, from Ukraine on uh, the liberation of your territories. Um, I don't think it was not just Turkey, which was unanimous in supporting <laughs> Azerbaijan. Ukraine was also unanimous from every political force and every media outlet in the country. Um, and uh, that, that was very, very important. Joking, joking before I say a question, when I've been listening to this very interesting um, exchange of opinions, I'm, I'm wondering whether the Armenian intelligence services were on holiday for the last 10 or 20 years. <laughs> or maybe they did not know how to use Google. Perhaps Yandex is not as good as Google, I don't know. Um, but my serious question to you, which I don't think has come up yet, is what do you, I mean, what to me, and it kind of relates to the previous question on the Minsk group, is um, the problem with the Minsk group was that the United States was absent from the region under two presidents. So it's not a question of political party, two different parties. And France was biased. Um, uh, both houses of the French Parliament voted in November to recognize the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. So France was supporting separatism in Azerbaijan and, and then at the same time claiming to support Ukraine's territorial integrity in the Minsk group over Donbass, over eastern Ukraine. It's a kind of a contradictory, a very strange multi-vector foreign policy. Um, <laughs> The U.S. here, the, uh, what would you like to see from the new U.S. administration in this region? Um, and broader than the Minsk group, what would you, you as the president of Azerbaijan, like to see the U.S. become more active, more involved, uh, more on the ground? Is it not time for the U.S. to return? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your congratulations and convey gratitude to our friends in Ukraine who supported Azerbaijan. We, we followed that. Of course, during the war, we were very sensitive to how countries uh, react to what happens, and therefore, strong position from Ukrainian society 
was highly appreciated that. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the questions, um, I fully agree with you that uh, France uh, was uh, acting on the side of the separatists, and this is true. And uh, I, on several occasions during uh, the war, was talking openly about that. And that was, of course, uh, inappropriate. Because uh, maybe many of you do not know, but I can tell you uh, the story how France became the co-chair. Because France was not from the very beginning the co-chair. France became the co-chair of the Minsk Group upon the request of uh, President Chirac. He insisted very much, and he was asking my late father many times. And then during my numerous meetings with late President Chirac, always he was telling me the same story, how he persuaded my father to allow France to be uh, co-chair of the Minsk Group. And he said, your father was objecting and openly saying no, because uh, he said, we have nothing to do against you, but you are a very strong Armenian diaspora. This diaspora will influence your decision-making process, and you eventually will be on the side of uh, Armenia. And uh, President Chirac persuaded him and promised him that it will not be the case. France will be neutral. And after that, my father gave agreement, because if he didn't give agreement, France wouldn't have been there. So this is just a reminder to some French politicians who probably do not know this story. And I can tell you, during uh, all period of uh, our close cooperation with France, uh, this neutrality and impartiality was uh, observed with different level of, uh, how to say, different level of neutrality, if I may say so. Even I can tell you that uh, when uh, President Hollande was attending a ceremony in Armenia on the 24th of April, the same day he took the plane and came to Baku. The same day. I was at that time in Chanakkala together with President Erdogan celebrating the victory in Chanakkala. And it happened that I arrived to Baku later than President Hollande. Yeah. He came earlier, and we met the next, the next morning. And I highly appreciated that, really appreciated it until today. Uh, I remember it as a real sign of politician, statesman, responsible person who, is, uh, who was a co-chair of the Minsk Group, and he clearly understood that if he goes to Yerevan on this occasion, which will be highly unpopular in Azerbaijan, he should come here in order to, to show respect to us, to have balance, to demonstrate neutrality. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, diplomatic practice was lost during the war, and even before, even before the war. Uh, unbalanced approach to Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, to Armenia and Azerbaijan from France, uh, was not only during the war, it was before the war. And there are many indicators, I just don't want to take much of your time. What happened during the war was absolutely strange, and uh, unfortunately, uh, what happened happened. But did it stop us from what we planned? No. Could they influence our will? No. And that was also a miscalculation. Miscalculation, because I want to talk openly. You know, uh, big countries, um, they are sometimes used that whatever they say to some other countries immediately is being implemented. They're used to that. It's a bad habit. They need to get rid of this bad habit. It's like smoking. You become addict to that. And when somebody uh, does not do what you want and what you say, uh, they become angry. Their anger just, uh, you know, <laughs> bothers them. Uh, nothing which was said to me during the war by anyone uh, to stop or to liberate what we already uh, li to liberate back, to give back territories was done. So, uh, but uh, I should also say that after war, situation changed. 
And uh, there have been delegations from France, there have been messages and uh, uh, proposals to normalize relations. I said, we didn't do anything wrong to our relations. We always were persistent, always were uh, committed to cooperation. But uh, what happened, happened, and absolutely, you're absolutely right when you say that France strongly supports Ukrainian territorial integrity and at the same time did not support territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. So this, I know how it calls, I just don't want to be rude. Uh, with respect to uh, what U.S. can do, and you said yourself in the beginning of your comments that U.S. was absent. So U.S. was absent and we resolve the problem. So I'm not saying, Matt, <laughs> that U.S. should be <laughs> absent, but, but we didn't get any message from new administration so far. Any message. Zero. Administration already since January, even before, because of the already process. Today it's April, zero message. Mr. Blinken called Pashinyan. I don't know what they talked about, but again the balance is, uh, how to say, disturbed. I am not saying that we're waiting for the call of Mr. Blinken, no, but it's a co-chair. They should at least behave in a way that is balanced. So we didn't get any messages. We don't know what is the position of US government on uh, issue related to our region. I received a kind letter from President Biden with respect to Novruz holidays. I'm grateful for that. But that was probably the only message of congratulations. I know these kind of messages are sent to some other countries. So that's probably it. Thank you. Ben mi? Tamam. Teşekkürler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I want to congratulate one more time. And we are very proud of you uh, from you. Turkey, Ahmed Uysal from Orsam Center. And we yesterday visited the Agdam region uh, and we observed the destruction. Honestly, it was like a war zone without fighting a war. I mean, I mean the, the fighting was not there, but it was like a war zone and the destruction uh, honestly disappointed us. The only thing they did was dig holes like moles, like Kerstebek in Turkish we say. They didn't bring any investment, any, any, they didn't build anything. It was like a very uh, sad story and they destroyed houses and theaters and mosques, etc. And I suggest under your, of course, uh, permission and to, maybe you are also thinking of that, uh, an international Karabakh forum, that we can be also part of it or partner to it. And it will attract a lot of Turkish tourists also, academicians and businessmen, etc. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. A very good idea. I think other can uh, work on that. I fully support its idea, International Karabakh Forum. Good idea with broad international participation, maybe events also here, events in the liberated territories. And uh, you know, what you've seen in Agdam is almost everywhere. Fizuli is even worse, because in Fizuli there is no buildings at all. In Agdam, they kept uh, half-destroyed mosque for two purposes. First, it was kind of a landmark for Armenian artillery to measure the distance. And second, it was an observation point. Because uh, uh, that direction of uh, our possible attack was expected by them. And if you looked uh, precisely on the way how we liberated territories, you will see that we did not go directly to Agdam, because Armenians were waiting us there. And they built a very uh, multi, how to say, stage uh, defense lines. So there could have been a lot of uh, losses. Therefore, our road to Agdam was opened after, and Agdam was uh, next after Shusha. So we were planning to go there from other side. And as Armenian uh, 
Prime Minister said if he did not sign Capitulation Act uh, on 10th November, they could have had 20,000 uh, losses. I'm not sure about the number, because if they had 20,000 <laughs> soldiers in Agdam, why they didn't fight? Yeah, it's a question. Why they keep 20,000 soldiers in Agdam while they lose uh, territories which they occupy? But it's another story. Uh, but uh, in Fizuli, it is even worse. In Fizuli, there is no buildings at all. Everything is demolished. In uh, Gubadli, they kept only two or three buildings which uh, they used as a military storage. In Zangilan, they, uh, they made some settlement in Zangilan. Uh, they wanted to people to settle, but they didn't have human resources. But also, uh, I can tell you what they've done to Shusha. <laughs> they always were saying that Shusha is an Armenian city, while it's a, it's a relatively new city. It was established in 1752 by Khan who came from Agdam region and who selected that uh, territory as a fortress in order to defend himself because he was attacked from different, <laughs> different sides. And uh, Shusha was settled by Panahali Khan and ruled by him and his uh, children and grandchildren until Ibrahim Khalil signed the Kurekchai Treaty uh, with Russia in 1805. And he thought he, he saves him his life. But after one year, Ibrahim Khalil and his family members were killed. That's a different, different story. But we need to know this history, definitely. And I ask you to, to look at that history of Kurek Chai peace agreement and what happened to the ruler of Karabakh after he signed it. Uh, so in Shusha, they said it's Armenian, but it was such a terrible shape. When I came the first time, I was really surprised. It's absolutely uh, devastation. They did not build any building. Only two villas they built for uh, leaders of Armenia and so-called Karabakh regime in the area which was uh, in Soviet times a sanatorium. Only destruction. I can tell you even more. Uh, when we entered the Hadrut region and the territories where there have been Armenian settlements, I haven't seen such a poverty anywhere, maybe for the last 20 years. And the question is, where did they, with, what did, did they do with all those money which they were collecting from diaspora? Every year they were conducting marathons, collecting tens of millions of dollars in California, in France, in Russia, everywhere. And you cannot see it there. It, it does not exist. So we'll have to restore it, and we will restore it. And I think Karabakh Forum is a good idea. So thank you for this initiative. We have Tamian. Yes, Asia possible. A question? I think everybody already asked a question, no? One gentleman, Taiman, from ADA. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'm Daniel Pommier from Sapienza University of Rome, Italy. Congratulations for restoring your national integrity. I think it's a lifetime achievement for a political leader. So compliments on, on personal basis too. So I want to ask, when do you think the IDP people are, will be allowed to return to the liberated territories? I, need, I know it's a long process that takes time, but I guess if you can give us some highlights in general terms of the returning process. Thank you, Mr. President. We want to, um, to return them as soon as possible. They have been waiting for so long time. But the biggest problem uh, is mines. Armenia did not give us a mine map, though we know that they have it. And after war stopped, we have uh, more than 100 casualties only among civilians, not to mention uh, military servicemen. And among those one, more than 100, more than 20 killed by the mines. So this is another war crime. 
because the war is over why don't you give us the mine uh, maps so we can you know clean those territories therefore uh, a lot of things is to be done with demining and demining is a very long process and it uh, takes time because we do not have enough qualified personnel we now organize training and also purchasing equipment the second important issue, and it has already started, is the assessment of the damage. Because we plan to sue Armenia in international uh, legal institutions for these devastations, what they've done. Therefore, we are, we are documenting all the devastations and destructions. We are creating a special passports for every building so that it's in the history and it will be a document to have a legal procedure. And of course, uh, infrastructure projects, because we cannot send the people in the middle of nowhere. There should be decent living standards. And we already started uh, projects. I can name some of them. For instance, uh, construction of uh, highways already started from Fizuli to Shusha from uh, Shusha to Jabrail, from Horadis to Zangilan, uh, from Barda to Agdam. All these are already in the process. The budget has been approved. Power generation, the lines, already the line to Shusha have been built. Uh, now power station in Shusha will be opened soon. And as I said, mm, maximum two years, all Karabakh will be you know, electrified and we will have access capacity. Then, uh, water supply. There is no water pipes. If people go there, what are they going to eat? What are they going to drink? How are they going to uh, have their you know, agricultural activity? We need to plan properly and, and city planning, of course, because everything is level to ground. Therefore, there will be new city planning projects. It's also now in the process. We started immediately, and I can tell you that the first city planning project which we will approve is Agdam uh, and other cities also. We started already one pilot project in one of the villages in Zangilan, Smart Village. I think the uh, beginning of uh, the reconstruction will start maybe next month, maybe in June, and Hopefully, by the end of the year, that pilot project can be already implemented. At the same time, I already, in my communications with our partners from different countries, I already raised this issue uh, to attract companies who can provide us with some ideas of city planning, of village planning, and uh, we want to invite these companies to work with us because our construction capability is not enough to rebuild this territory. As I said, for Luxembourg, we have to, <laughs> to rebuild. <laughs> it's a serious task. Uh, therefore, uh, it's difficult to say when all of them will be returned, but they will be returned in stages, most probably the return will start from those villages which are situated close to infrastructure. For instance, in Agdam, Fizuli, Jabrail, they were easier to bring lines of electricity and water. And um, slowly, slowly, we will uh, continue. At the same time, we are building now, we are planning, not yet, planning to build the airport in Lachin, because to get to Lachin is not easy. We need to have uh, cargo plane there in order to develop. And uh, the road to Kelbajar also is being built. Existing road uh, now is under control of the Russian peacekeepers. We are using this road, but sometimes it is not, uh, not known when and how. Therefore, uh, we need to build a lot of tunnels because the height of the mountains is 3.5 thousand meters and these roads uh, did not exist before. So again, I am uh, a little bit difficult for me to say exactly when, but in stages 
probably, hopefully, starting from the next year, first IDPs already must be settled. Good luck and God bless you. Thank you. Thank I would sir, just like to break the protocol and yes. say one thing. Yes. Actually, uh, we had arranged uh, live coverage of uh, this conference in Pakistan through your Facebook page and a lot of uh, young people are watching yeah. and they just texted me to tell you that uh, your leadership is uh, not only the source of motivation for the Azerbaijani youth but for the youth in Pakistan also. <laughs> and they especially you. told me to uh, ask all the participants to have a special clap for the president. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And I have one, uh, oh, it has been already presented to you. It's the first edition, first edition of uh, what we've done uh, about the former look of the cities and and the destruction. There will be many books like that, but uh, this is the first edition and it will be, or it is already distributed, distributed. So you are the first receivers of this book. So thank you once again for being with us. Thank you for your questions. And now we have a picture ceremony.